Welcome to Pod Revisited, episode 30. I'm Tori. And I'm Shay. Today we are discussing chapter 12 of Chamber of Secrets, The Apologies Potion. Or, as we like to call it, Slytherins Eat Feet. So unfortunately, uh, Robbie Coltrane has passed away, the actor who played Hagrid in all the Harry Potter movies. Yeah, it's uh, it's very sad. He seemed like a really, really nice guy. It seemed like he had such a good, impactful role in the lives of all of the children who were acting around him in this film. It seemed like he loved the role as much as the role loved him. And I think that's beautiful. I think it's hard for our generation to like see the passing of these these actors and actresses who played these roles to us because it it feels like Harry Potter is frozen in time for so many of us and it's weird to think that some of the people we return to and just see in that way and remember in that way aren't with us anymore it's hard but their work lives on it's like he said in the Harry Potter 20 year special that like he's going to go but you know Hagrid will be around still serving terrible baked goods to children so jumping into the chapter we are finally introduced to dumbledore's office which i think is probably one of the most cooler locations in the series absolutely i feel like the th- film did a really good job at like kind of like capturing the, the circular room with all its like random little instruments and everything yeah it looks a little bit like a combo of like the back section of an antique shop mixed with like one of those old stores where everyone like would bring in their old radios to get fixed because it's like equal parts weird looking almost tech and just like old looking artifacts that are probably a little bit moldy. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like Dumbledore. I think he's low key kind of a hoarder, but I mean, he's been around a while. I feel like if you get that old, you kind of need to keep things to remember like your past by. So Harry is in Dumbledore's office and he sees the sorting hat and Harry's kind of been struggling with the idea that he's supposed to be in Slytherin and his place in wizarding society and like his family and genetics and blood status and everything. Yeah. So Harry puts the hat on and of course the hat tells him you would have done well in Slytherin and he is not happy about it because Slytherin's bad and he doesn't he's worried that he's got Slytherin blood in him which he can't have and all this stuff that's a lot for a 12 year old to be thinking about Uh, I also have some points about this uh, sorting hat moment first of all I love how personified he is like obviously he's a character and not an object but I love the sorting hat's personality like he's got a bit of an attitude like he knows Harry's like please just reassure me Gryffindor is a good choice for me and the hat's like "Mm, yeah eh." but Slytherin Slytherin would have been good remember when I said Slytherin Eh? Harry's like god damn it (laughs) And it's just like, it is what it is. And the hat's just going to lay it out like that. And I respect it. I like the hat. The, the hat sticks to its decisions. Yeah. Like, he's not backpedaling. He's like, I stand by what I said. I also think that, like, the hat isn't wrong. Harry would have done well in Slytherin. It would have been a different sort of story. A lot of things would have been different. But I think being in Slytherin would have encouraged certain things in Harry that I think would have been very, very good for him. I feel like being in Slytherin House would have encouraged Harry to learn a lot more about humility. Like he'd have to be around the children of what he knows to be Death Eaters and sort of learn to understand that like they just want their parents to love them. They just want to live up to the standards their parents set for them. They're living up to the expectations and they're doing what they were told to believe in. And maybe they're not inherently bad people. They've just never been put in circumstances to be good people. So I feel like he would have learned a lot more of that and maybe have like a more empathetic touch and more of like a social opportunity to fight evil if he had been in Slytherin rather than just fighting it physically with magic all the time in like basically the battlefield. I also think he would have learned a lot more about empathy if he were in Slytherin house. Mm -hmm. And again, and to some extent, like how to communicate politically because he'd be surrounded by Slytherins all the time and you don't want to hate everyone that's like living in your dorm room. But you also obviously don't like Voldemort so he'd have to learn like to walk a fine line with what he says and what he stands for and like try to put his positions in a way that can be more understandable to the Slytherins and I just think it would have been a really interesting opportunity for Harry to learn certain things and skills that he doesn't necessarily have early on in Gryffindor. And obviously Harry would be good for Slytherin House. I mean, he's a nice guy. He's a sweet guy. He'd earn them a lot of house points. They'd like that. I think uh, 
and then being more sympathetic to Harry Potter because they knew him better would also, I think, in the long run, have a good impact on like where they stand when the final battle comes. So I don't think the Sorting Hat is wrong. I think Harry obviously does well in Gryffindor, but he would have also done well in Slytherin. Of course, Harry comes away from the Sorting Hat and he finds Dumbledore's bird, which of course bursts into flames. And it's so funny, I forgot about this, but right before... If that happens, Harry's thinking that the bird looks sick and he's like, oh, just my luck that the bird would die before Dumbledore comes in and the bird bursts into flames like that exact moment. Can you imagine if Dumbledore decided to fuck with him and just comes in and he's like, first you fucking try and kill those students and now my bird. Dumbledore's only evil when it's not fun. You know, he, he couldn't have leaned in and had some fun with it. Snape would have had fun with it. Of course, Snape would have. Yeah, but um, I fa- hey, Dumbledore kind of goes into this whole thing about like, this is a phoenix and this is what they can do. And also they're very faithful and loyal. And it just feels like he's setting Harry up to, you need to know about this. Hint, hint. Yeah. Hey, hey Harry, I sure do love loyalty. <laughs> yeah, and loyalty is like, I think faith, faithful pets is like, emphasized in like the, the sentence it's in italics so like Dumbledore's really being like they're faithful hint hint like this is important this will come back wink wink nudge nudge so you know just Dumbledore doing Dumbledore things yeah I uh, think it's kind of funny how Harry takes so long to decide if he has something to tell Albus like Albus is like Harry is there anything you want to tell me and Harry's like ah mm, ooh. and he like thinks through all the things he has going on and decides he doesn't want to tell them and it's just so like internalizes it Harry to like like really think about it so well. he, he can't just lie up front he has to think about it for a little bit and i'm like there's no way you don't know okay harry potter is holding something back he does not he's an open book emotionally i think yeah he he is an open book i just think it's very uh interesting that haggard like bursts into Dumbledore's office when he hears that harry's being like questioned and under suspicion because Hagrid respects Dumbledore like he's the number one Dumbledore fan in like the series and he won't see that word about him and he respects him a lot and I just feel like it takes a lot for Hagrid just to burst into his office like I feel like he would normally and he would respect Dumbledore and like would wait if he knew he was in with someone but he like doesn't want Harry getting in trouble because it's basically what happened to him that he was basically like framed and he doesn't want that happening to Harry so he's like you gotta believe me it's not him and and yeah, but Dumbledore doesn't think it's Harry. He's incredibly empathetic to the situation and also Harry is his favorite. So I feel like personally, that's like the one area like it's the perfect intersection of things to make it so important to Hagrid that it would overpower his like blind loyalty to Dumbledore and like deep respect for Dumbledore and like it's the right set of circumstances for him to be like, I love you and I respect you, but I need to interrupt you and make sure this doesn't happen. Yeah, going back to uh, Harry um, kind of thinking about what to say to Dumbledore, I'm just wondering why doesn't he tell Dumbledore? Like he's thinking about all the things he's done and how it's weird. But I'm like, at the end of the last book, like he, Dumbledore's basically just like, ask me anything you want and I'll tell you the answers if I want to. And he was very honest to Harry. I mean, we what we assume was him being honest, Harry back back then. But um, yep. I feel like they had Harry, Harry really like was really like Dumbledore at that moment because he felt like he could talk to him. And I just like Harry's just hiding all these secrets, and he's just like, you know what, it's not worth it. And it just would have saved him a lot of probably like I don't know trauma. I think that. I mean, first of all, I don't think Harry lies when he says to Dumbledore the answer that like, no, there's nothing I want to tell you because he actually doesn't want to tell Dumbledore any of that. There's lots of things he should tell Dumbledore, but he doesn't want to tell Dumbledore those things. So he's being honest. But I also think that like, he's feeling insecure at the moment because all these people think these bad things about him. The hat just told him he would have done well in Slytherin. And I feel like he respects Dumbledore in a way that he maybe doesn't want tarnished. Like he doesn't want to tell Dumbledore things about himself that are could be seen as negative because he probably really admired Dumbledore and like it probably felt really good having Dumbledore like have that sort of person to person talk with him at the end of last year and I think it's something he wouldn't want to compromise like saying by the way I've been hearing voices and no one else is hearing them and also am I the heir of Slytherin I could be the heir of Slytherin am I the heir like I feel like he just Dumbledore isn't someone that he's that close to they've had one good chat and he doesn't want to tarnish that so he's like 
It's like with your boss. You're not going to tell your boss why you look like crap that day because you stayed up too late watching whatever on TV. That's not your boss's business. You'll just say, oh, sorry, I didn't put my eyebrows on today. You know, like you just sort of tell them what they need to know and keep the rest to yourself because you want to live up to a certain expectation. And Harry's so afraid, I think, of letting Dumbledore down already that he's like, I can't let him know that anything is going on that's weird. He needs to think everything is splendid. Um, That being said, I think if Harry had told him any of these things, like, hey, I think Draco Malfoy might be opening the Chamber of Secrets. Dumbledore would say, ha ha ha, I don't, don't worry about it. And if Harry was like, hey, but Hermione's brewing apologies potion and we're gonna go and interrogate Draco, he'd probably be like, that seems dangerous. Risky business. Wouldn't expect that from Granger. And like, that's the most they're gonna get from him because it's Dumbledore and he wants them to get into all this trouble. Of course he does. It's Dumbledore. Well, Harry, of course, isn't under suspicion by Dumbledore. Dumbledore's just wanting to, you know, talk to him. Harry's off the hook and so he's let out and of course the school is freaking out after this next attack because of what happened to nearly headless nick and i do not blame them because i spoke about in the last episode that it's like something that could affect something that's not technically alive scary yeah that's scary it is it's such a level of unknown especially for like a magic school where there's so many things that are unknown and revealed to them all the time to have something that like they can tell even the teachers and the professors and the staff are uncomfortable about is probably like yeah it's got there's bad vibes in the air And so, of course, all the kids are like, I'm leaving the castle for Christmas break. I'm out of here. But Harry and co are staying. Yeah, of course they are. I mean, you know, why go? First of all, I have, why not, you know, why just go to Egypt with your family? Egypt is so cool. I would kill to go to Egypt. And then keep in mind that the Weasleys don't have a lot of money. So how can they all afford to go to Egypt all of a sudden? Like, that's... It would be a rare and unique opportunity. I think that the kids should all go if the parents suddenly have money for Egypt. But then on top of that, but like they mentioned going to Egypt and them just choosing not to go, which again sounds crazy to me. But on top, especially for like the twins, think of how much trouble they could get in into like a cursed tomb or something of a long dead pharaoh. Like that's their entire dream. I think that would be great. Yeah, I have the whole theory about this because so it does feel weird that like the Weasleys all decide to stay. Because this is Jenny's first year away from home, and I just feel like it's their it's like their first year of no kids. I feel like they'd want the kids back, especially with Jenny. Like I don't we don't know if she suspects herself, but she knows something's wrong with her. So I feel like she'd want to go home. And I kinda of see maybe why Percy would stay, but like I feel and like Ron would stay because Harry wants to stay. But I feel but yeah, it's just very weird. But we know that later on in the book that uh, Mr. Weasley was fined like 50 galleons for the flying car so i'm wondering if because it was a money issue they knew that their parents couldn't afford really to take them to egypt so they're like oh no we'll stay at hogwarts it's fine mom and dad oh interesting i i did not think of that as an option because i feel like mrs weasley would like i feel like they really couldn't afford to take them but mrs weasley didn't want to tell them that you can't come but I also think, like, why are they visiting Bill right at this time? Why wouldn't they just stay home after this big loss? But I'm wondering if maybe they're having money issues and Bill works with the bank. So maybe he's more of, like, financially sound and that's why they're seeing him. Oh, so he can, like, afford to, like, feed them for the week of Christmas vacation, sort of? So maybe Bill's kind of, like, sp- sporting this, like, because we know they visit Bill in Egypt the next year when they win the lottery. Yeah, that's an interesting thing is they make it seem so, like, wow, family goes on trip, dream trip to Egypt. And it's kind of like they just did that last year. It's it's kind of a weird choice. It's kind of, like, a uh, weird weird excuse to do it again in this book because last book they went to go visit charlie but it kind of made like sense i guess why the kids didn't go because like they are just like plot stuff but i just feel like they could have made another excuse why they had to stay yeah absolutely i like your theory though i never thought about that way but yeah the idea that like it costs more money to travel and they just decided it would be better for their parents to like get to go and see him but for them not to cost anything Hogwarts is free. Yeah. That's that's kind of a nice idea. I like that a lot. I don't think that's something Ron thought of. And I don't even know if Ginny thought of it. Like, I feel like it's almost the kind of thing that like maybe the twins would come up with. I think either the twins or Percy because it feels like a very older sibling thing. Like you're, they're trying to like protect, like Fred and George are still decent older brothers. Like they're trying to protect the younger siblings from like the kind of like the things that they don't really realize. So yeah. they might not be aware of it, but Percy and maybe Fred and George are aware of it. And they're just like, okay guys, like let's stay at Hogwarts this year. Yeah. Like mom and dad are going to go visit Bill. And like, I, I don't think they need to be persuaded to stay. Like Fred and George love having the come room to themselves and getting up to mischief without mom and dad around absolutely yeah so going back i was just uh, i wanted to make a point about uh the twins and their way of lightening up the mood about harry being the heir slytherin yeah hilarious <laughs> they uh i mean honestly i kind of feel like with the twins sort of cracking jokes in front of harry and shouting in the hallways like make way for the heir of slytherin 
I think it's probably got to be, in my mind, reassuring for the other students. Because if he really were the ear of Slytherin, he wouldn't be, like, allowing the shenanigans. And, like, the twins would be in danger for doing it. And, like, the fact that they're so casual about it and, like, Harry's just kind of rolling his eyes about it. And, like, to me, that makes him look even more innocent, you know? Yeah, but, well, the twins think it's funny. And they wouldn't actually think it were funny if Harry was going around killing people. So it's probably not Harry. Yeah, Harry likes it because it makes it seem more ridiculous that he's the heir of Slytherin and Percy not happy because it's Percy. But also Ginny is also very upset when they start doing this. And I'm just wondering, like, how much is she, she starting to suspect herself? Does she think it's her? Or is she thinking that just something is wrong with her and this whole thing going around is just kind of like getting to her? I think it's interesting because like the Weasleys are pure blood. So like they probably can trace their lineage back far enough to like know if they were related to Salazar Slytherin. So I think it's kind of weird that like Ginny hasn't just like gone to the library and done that sort of research and been like, okay, I'm not related to Slytherin. So something else is afoot. I don't know. It just feels like lineages are probably kept in big old fancy books at Hogwarts that you can check out because. Yeah. She won't be too scared. I just feel like. We know by the end of the book that she was having like blank periods of time where she just would find herself like places that she didn't remember how she got there. So she's having like blackouts and she's like not really know what, what's going on and all these bad stuff's happening. So I feel like she's just very confused about like what's going on right now. So circumstance wise, they get really lucky that Draco, Crab, and Goyle are all staying at Hogwarts for Christmas. Yeah. And uh, they say basically that Crab and Goyle are staying because Draco's staying and they just do whatever he tells them to. And I think that's an interesting sort of uh, relationship between Crab, Goyle, and Draco in that... Like, they seem to always just do what he tells them. And I wonder, like, what is the mutual beneficial aspects of their relationship? Like, Draco gets lackeys. He gets big buff dudes to stand behind him and make him look intimidating. I I guess from them on their side, Crab and Goyle get some sort of, like, social standing because Draco seems to come across as a bit of a leader, like a popular boy. Their dads are Death Eaters, too, so... Yeah, and also his dad's status. I feel like specifically in people who are like very blood status oriented people like the Malfoys are just given an air of status as is so I feel like their parents probably encourage it like we wish Lucius Malfoy paid more attention to us so do your best to get in good with his son it'll be good for you in the long run but also just like it feels like because they're not very intelligent or smart or goal oriented it kind of feels like having someone there to make choices for them and like take away having to think too much is probably good for them yeah they definitely have a follower attitude at least at this part of the book we know that crab kind of gets like a sense of self in the end of the series but like they're very much just kind of like they need someone to tell them what to do they've probably been told what to do by their parents and then Draco's was just basically replaced with that yeah that's the other thing right they're deciding not to go home to their families at christmas too when if Draco told them not to so i like it makes me wonder like what kind of home lives do a lot of these hogwarts students have that like they're that easy to be like never mind i don't want to go home for christmas because Draco said no like It it, it makes me feel kind of bad, like they're assholes and I don't like them. But also I can only imagine having Death Eaters as parents is not ideal. Um, It's rough. I hope there's some therapy going on over Christmas vacation. Yeah, Hogwarts needs therapy. Speaking of needing therapy, uh, the Dursleys send Harry a present, which is a toothpick, and also a note being like, actually, can you stay at school for summer? Because we don't want you here. Yeah. Like, what, what's the point of that? They're just, I mean, I think Dumbledore or Minerva McGonagall or someone, probably not Dumbledore, probably Minerva McGonagall, send out a letter, like, reminding them, like, hey, don't forget, Harry's at school, you should definitely send him a Christmas present. And they're like, we want the scary witch lady to know we're sending Harry a package, so we'll send him a package, but we don't want Harry to get anything of value, so we're gonna <laughs> wrap a toothpick. Class act, the Dursleys. To go through the work of wrapping it and mailing it. Yeah, I just feel like it's so much more effort. Yeah. Like, if they don't care about him like they're just they put in more effort for like things just to make him feel bad and i'm like well you're just spending all this emotional and like mental time on him and you don't even like him yeah what's the point but anyway so they hermione wakes up and goes into and finishes the potion so she tells the boys that the potion's ready so they are gonna use the apologist potion and interrogate malfoy tonight woot woot so we get a little bit of a the christmas dinner and hecker's drinking all the eggnog and getting drunk Per Classic usual. Classic Hagrid. Always, always drunk. 
for everybody else. I also love that they compare Hermione talking about her plan to like spike the buffins or the cupcakes for Crab and Goyle. And like they say she has like a glisten in her eyes, kind of like Minerva McGonagall. And I love that the idea of someone who's like very aware of the rules and like understands their purpose. But when they're breaking them in a way that's very organized and everything's falling into place, there's like a bit of a a twinkle of like joy you know like both the satisfaction of having put together a brilliant plan and the excitement of rule breaking i mean is the plan brilliant i think it's a very flawed plan <laughs> i mean it's brilliant in their minds and it works so eh. as a 12 year old you probably think it's great but there's just so many it's like this is the best idea ever there's so many like holes if like one thing had gone wrong everything would have gone wrong absolutely yeah we they, they are very lucky that hermione at age 12 is such a gifted potioner because even though the sleeping drop isn't one of the most dangerous potions she's mixing it with cupcakes i don't think you'll learn that in potions class and like i'm sure you kind of have to figure out how much to get like the yeah. dosage is probably important and things like this so like she could have seriously hardened crab and goyle she could have poisoned them she could have killed them you know like she has to have so much confidence in her potioneering and also just it's risky business but she also told them to steal their shoes and she got rose from the laundry so which i super duper love i'm like oh I, I didn't think about it but i'm like yeah their feet are gonna change sizes that makes sense the part that is stupid is when they go into the separate stalls to take the potions they don't first take off their clothes and put on the new clothes or take off their clothes transform they like yeah. take the potion in their own clothes that they just said are gonna be too small once they've taken the potion and proceed to take the potion in those clothes and then their clothes rip and their shoes are too tight it's stupid i feel like that's an error in writing because in reality, the clothes would have like burst or like ripped or whatever. Well, that's what it says, right? His shirt's like tearing and his like feet hurt him so much in the shoes. And it's just like, you literally just did the smart thing of planning for that. And then you're like, we'll do that later. So dumb. I like to think Hermione did that the right way because we get only Harry's perspective. I feel like Hermione went into the separate bathroom stall, took off her robes, put on the Millicent robes, and then took her potion. Because she seems like the type who would think that through and the boys just didn't. They, the way Harry describes taking the apology potion sounds really gross and just like terrible to me. I think the film did a really get, great job at kind of like explaining it because Harry describes it like his organs are like melting or something. Yeah, his skin feels like it's burning and bubbling and like... you. <laughs> pretty gross i think it's cute that the apologist potion sort of has a different color for each of the people that they're turning into or cats that they're turning into um i think that's fun and like i guess they're kind of gross colors because it's polyjuice potion but they could also be gross colors because crab and goyle are gross people so i, I guess it's, it's also like the type of person you are because i exactly. think in the last book when they become Harry. I think Hermione or Ron says that, that he actually didn't taste bad. Yeah. As Paul just potion, because Harry is a, general, is a good... That's such a weird thing to say to your friend. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. It's, I was actually thinking about that one. That's such a weird thing to say, but you know. Mm, Harry, you taste good. What? These kids do not have any boundaries. So if someone was to drink a polyjuice potion of you, what color would it be? I would say purple just because that's my favorite color. But Okay, see, I would also say purple, but like a really dark, almost black, inky purple for me, I think. Because like I'm not the best person ever, so it has to look a little bit like, mm, do I really want to eat that? But also kind of interesting potion type. And I like crunchy. I feel like I'm a big fan of like crunchy food. So there'd be like bits in it, which would make it less appealing as well. <laughs> Actually, can mine be a dipping sauce? Can mine be a dippy sauce that someone like dumps like dino shaped veggie nuggies into? That's how you have to consume the polyjuice potion to be me. The dipping sauce? If if I was a dipping sauce, I would be creamy garlic because that's all I eat. <laughs> oh, I, I, I've been really into like a, a mayo honey situation lately. Like you mix a mayo and a honey. So I think I'd be something like that, but still that dark purple color. But you have to dip. If you don't dip a veggie dino nuggie into me, it's, it's not right. You have to do it with the... It won't, it won't work properly. <laughs> so my whole thing about this plan that doesn't make any sense is the fact that they didn't know where the Slytherin common room was. Because like, that's like the whole point is that they need, they only have 60 minutes, but they should take time off because they're going to transform back. So they need to take some time off so they can leave before they transform. But they didn't, they had no idea where the Slytherin common room was. They just lucked out and found it, but they wasted a bunch of time. And I'm like, if you're going to be doing this properly, you should have like done surveillance or something to figure out where the common room was. That also feels like something Hermione probably knew. And then she was so traumatized by not knowing what the end results of her 
potion to turn into a cat was that she forgot to tell them or she had told them and they forgot because I feel like there's no way Hermione isn't like we take the potion we go to the place we ask the questions we leave Hermione doesn't go into that not knowing where the place is um that's just not who I feel like Hermione probably found out where the Slytherin common room is like by reading a book from the library or by like just mentioning in front of a Slytherin that the Gryffindor common room is the best common room in all of Hogwarts. The way they find out where the common room is, is they're walking into the dungeons, because all they know is that the Slytherins come up from the dungeons. And they run into a prefect, who happens to be Ravenclaw, and she's like, what do you mean our common room? And she's like very suspicious of them, and I don't doubt her, because like two Slytherins like pretending not to know where the common room is, it seems like Really very... weird, yeah. She's like, wow, are you two really that dumb? And they leave. And I found this really interesting because we know that prefect is Percy's girlfriend. And so she just happens to be in the dungeons and leaves. And then like a few minutes later, they run into Percy, who's also in the dungeons. Oh, they were canoodling. Secret rendezvous. Oh, do we think they were like canoodling? The real reason Percy wanted to stay at Hogwarts over Christmas. <laughs> oh my God, to be with his girlfriend. Oh, that's kind of sweet though. Romantic. That's kind of not. I mean, good for you, Percy. I feel like they're like holding hands and studying like, you know, but romantically. <laughs> or maybe they had like a cute, like we don't know what's going on in their lives because they're not Harry Potter. Maybe they have like a cute little romantic adventure going on where they're trying to use their mad prefect skills to catch who the heir of Slytherin is and like they're doing their own plotting and... Yeah, well, that's what uh, Malfoy assumes Percy's doing is trying to catch the heir of Slytherin. But um, speaking of Malfoy, he finds them, of course, and takes them to the common room. He's like, oh, there you two are. I've misplaced my idiots. <laughs> yeah. And it sounds awesome. The common room sounds awesome. The other ones sound like warmer and cozier. And yeah, the southern one doesn't really sound cozy, but it sounds so much more like mysterious and intriguing. Like the green glow from the lake, the like stone, the, the high back chairs. There's something about it that like seems a little more like spooky straight out of like a Scooby-Doo episode. Yeah, I feel like the Gryffindor common room is very like cozy. It just feels like red and like plush chairs and like a burning fire, like very cozy. And like the Slytherin one feels more like, cold, but more like a modern kind of feel, like almost like those like fancy showrooms. Oh, interesting. I don't see it as modern. I almost see it as antique. Yeah, I kind of feel like it's like a, like a really like high end kind of like aristocratic feel. Yeah, it's like very old, but delicate I feel like the chairs are almost throne like in the way they describe how high the backs are I feel like the Gryffindor common room to me would have like almost like a patchwork vibe to it even though I'm sure everything's nice I feel like I could see them having like a, a gold colored patch on a red couch that had a bit of a tear but I feel like the Slytherin's common room is a little more uh intricate and like ornate um but at the same time I I, I almost picture it as like a little dustier a little dimmer it's a good vibe. Like, it's a vibe that, like, I, I respect and like the vibe of the Gryffindor common room. It's cozy, hanging out with your friends, hot chocolate and popcorn feelings. But, like, there's something about the Slytherin common room that appeals to me as a person who is a Slytherin that's just, like, yes, that's that's what I actually want. Like, I could have a cozy, warm bed, but I want my common room to be the most magical possible. And seeing the creatures under the Black Lake and stuff is probably exactly what I would want as a lover of ocean creatures. So he brings them into the common room while he goes to get them something because he wants to show them something. And um, all right, so he finds, he gets a news clipping that his dad sent him that basically says that Arthur Weasley's been fined like 50 galleons for his flying car. And he's like, isn't that funny? Isn't it hilarious? And Ron, of course, is trying to... Ugh, I can't believe Ron doesn't punch him. I would have like punched him directly in the ween or something. But they're all also terrible actors to begin with. Not the actors who play the characters but the characters trying to play crab and goyle are just do you feel like it's surprising that malfoy doesn't really notice that they're acting weird but i just feel like he doesn't really pay attention really to crab and goyle they're just like yeah they're just there and he like it's more just like a sounding board for him and i feel like he does most of the talking so when they're asking him things he's like yeah whatever he doesn't really pay attention to like any kind of weird like mannerisms they may have because he doesn't pay attention to it absolutely i think draco is very self-centered and because he's so self-centered he doesn't really take the time to be suspicious like it sounds like he's a very inattentive friend it's not a lot like hey what's going on with you guys i don't even think i would call them friends they're not really friends it's just like it, they're his cronies yeah they're lackeys they feel like his lackeys for sure um, I mean, I get that the beneficial relationship for them is having someone of status to be around, and I get it, but 
he's just he's not an attentive friend he doesn't really care what's going on with them he's like where were you not as in like oh what are you up to but like why weren't you where i wanted you to be yeah like i wanted to show you this thing and you weren't here you're supposed to be here when i need you that's what i expect of you and there's no like return of like what they expect of draco you know they're lucky to get anything one thing i found interesting is that uh Malfoy kind of goes on a rant about like how Dumbledore is just a terrible person and he's covering things up and that his dad says that Dumbledore is the worst thing that ever happened and he does say that like Dumbledore never would have let like Muggleborn or a proper headmaster wouldn't let Muggleborns into this school and I'm just wondering like I feel like that's super illegal. Super illegal yeah. Like a, a headmaster can't like be like oh you can come in but you can't. I feel like the it's like a, the ministry like we know Dumbledore does things his own way but like I feel like the ministry would be involved if some headmaster is like you you can't come in. Now, that's racist. You can't be racist. I mean, schools are notoriously racist. Like, academia is incredibly biased and racist and meant to keep wealthy people getting into wealthy people's schools. But I think as blatantly as just, like, no one can attend this school that has this lineage is too much. And they wouldn't be able to justify that in, like, any type of wizarding court or a to any board of wizard school directors. Yeah, so Malfoy's just kind of deluded. I just feel like his dad's just saying these stuff and he's parroting it, but it doesn't make any sense, actually. Absolutely. I don't think Malfoy ever critically thinks about the things his his family tells him. I think he just like, dad said this, people respect dad. I will repeat it. They will respect me in the same way. Monkey see, monkey do. Like, copying his father. Uh, He doesn't have the critical thinking skills yet, I think, to even question how impractical that would be. And how, like, the majority of the wizarding world is probably okay with Muggleborns going there because it's the norm, it's how it's been, and most of them probably actually have muggles in their lineage. Like, that's just the way it is. But, yeah, it's it's very um, not logical on the part of Draco, and it's kind of... Yeah, it's just... I mean, it's just who he is. One of the things that I sort of forgot to mention is that the password to the Slytherin common room is pure blood. And I think we need to talk about that because it's it's not good. So uh, we talked a lot early on sort of about being Slytherins and how not all Slytherins are bad people and how just the people, the Slytherin houses earned a reputation and it only seeks out students that match the reputation rather than what it truly means. But when it comes down to it, none of the students are picking what the password is that's just not how it works so either i feel like it should be a prefect or like a head or something i don't think the professors make the passwords i don't think the professors make the passwords either because i can't see snape wasting his time with it but to me there's got to be some sort of sentient being of some sense of from some position of authority that creates these passwords and this should not be allowed it's like Pure blood is an immediately discriminatory term. It's offensive to probably most students. And it's not like it's incredibly ridiculous that in any part of any thorough like rules or regulations for passwords that got through. Like it's such a small thing in the story, but it's such a huge example of like how someone somewhere is dropping the ball when it comes to Slytherin House and just given up and doesn't give a shit and is like you guys can be assholes because that's what we expect of you now and it's horrible like the, even i don't severus snape wouldn't even stand for the password being pure blood you know what i mean i, I just don't think he can be bothered with stuff like that he's here yeah you know but i just i, I want to know who comes up with them or what comes up with them and how no person with any sense of common decency is like wait that's a terrible password that's offensive that's rude it's elitist it's douchey let's just not have offensive passwords like i always assumed the prefects or like the head boy or girl made up the passwords but i could be wrong i mean i i wouldn't think the prefects do just because what we know when ron and hermione are prefects they don't make passwords they do know of the password but i think hermione says that they were told the password by the head girl so that's why i assume it must be someone higher up yeah but it just seems offensive and awful. And I, it really bothers me a lot because as a person who's like, some Slytherins can be good people. They just need to encourage those traits in them and stuff. It's like, this is the kind of thing that squanders the ability of someone in Slytherin House to just be a cool person. It's like, they need to literally need to say something douchey to get into their common Well, it room. probably just shows like the lack of like guidance and like attention people are paying Slytherin House. Like they're not being like, like Gryffindor can never have like a, 
Gryffindor rules password or whatever because McGonagall would be like shutting that down immediately because she's always I mean Gryffindor rules is fine but that's a terrible pa- as a person who works in like security and technology <laughs> go Habs go don't do it guys I don't know I'm trying to think of something offensive they could have it as but uh, I just feel like McGonagall is very aware of uh of what they're doing so she's very involved in the house and like all the shenanigans and i feel like snape's very much detached from it like i think she she would put her foot down if they were like trying to make the password like slytherins eat feet yeah (laughs) or something like specifically offensive or even offensive at all like gryffindor rocks isn't offensive but anything that's offensive should not be allowed to be a password and the fact of the matter is pure blood is offensive because the term only matters and to the extent that you use it to dehumanize and devalue people who have mixed lineage and it's douchey yeah it's just just feeding into the vibe that all of southern house is kind of evil and they're all for this stuff yeah and nobody cares to change that you know which is terrible. I would have been a good Slytherin and I would have not stood for that. Keeping in mind for that kind of vibe and like thinking, it's a very sinister moment that when Malfoy's explaining kind of like some facts about when the chamber is open before that someone died and he hopes that Hermione is the one that dies this time. And like that's someone wishing someone to die. Like it's, it's just like the implications of that. Like it's a children's book at this point, but like the implications of that as an adult, like that's very like... But also I feel like it's the kind of thing you totally say when you're that young. Like he's 12, right? Like I feel like if 12-year-old me was playing with my My Little Ponies and someone picked one up and threw it in the mud, I'd be like, oh my gosh, I hope you die. And like I don't actually mean that, but I also don't know what that means because I'm 12, you know? Yeah, I do think that uh, this is just Draco kind of parroting like things what his dad says. Like he knows that he doesn't like Muggleborns and he's been raised that way. And also Hermione just gets on his nerves in every inconceivable way to him she's better than him and he can't stand it because she's a constant reminder that despite his fancy blood he's not as smart as her yeah and he can't stand it so like he obviously wants her to die because yeah she's the biggest thorn in his side at this point but he doesn't really understand the implications of it i think it comes back to bite him later in the series where he actually is like made almost made to kill someone and he kind of realizes what, what that is and even in the last book like when he has the opportunity to basically say like this is Hermione Granger and basically kill her secondhand like he he can't go through with it because of just like the implications it's too much on him as a person but when you're 12 you're not yeah you're not thinking about it yeah he's 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 not a great guy but he's not he's not a death eater like he's not he doesn't actually have the intention and the hatred deep in him, I think. I think he just... And in this particular case, I think it's pretty, like, he's thinking about this situation that's happening that doesn't directly impact him, like something in the school is killing Muggleborns. And he is thinking, how can this be advantageous to me? I personally dislike Hermione Granger. Wouldn't it be great if this situation that doesn't really impact me directly worked out to my benefit? Um, so I think it's just selfish children stuff, you know, but it is, it is a weird thing to read. It'll just like, yeah, as a grown up now, like casual, casual, I hope she dies. Like again, that therapist at Hogwarts <laughs> really should be. Okay. So basically another reason why this plan was terrible is the fact that like, they didn't really realize that they were turning back until they were literally turning back while they're in the common room. And I think if Hermione was there or if they were smart, they would have set like a timer, like took themselves like five, 10 minutes just to leave the common room. Because the way they leave is so suspicious. It's so weird. They're just like standing up and like hurrying up being like, oh, gotta go to the hospitaling. But because- My stomach hurts, bye. Yeah, but because Draco is so like nonchalant about crime and doesn't really care about them. He's not really paying attention. But like, it's just like, it's just like, it's a good thing he wasn't really paying attention because it could have been like really weird. If he was cared at all actually about the well-being of his friends, he would have been a little bit suspicious, but he had finished saying the thing he was excited to tell them about and he was done with their being yeah. around anyway. <laughs> he said, they, they serve their purpose. I'm done now. But uh, they run back up to the bathroom to find Hermione so they can share all their information and check on her. And Hermione is just like, won't come out of the cubicle and morning Myrtle is of course there to make everything worse. And we find out that Hermione had put a cat's hair in her potion, not um, Millicent Bulstrode's hair. 
And so she turned into a cat. What a <laughs> catastrophe. Yeah, kind of her Har- is actually quite lucky that Madame Pomfrey like didn't ask any questions and stuff because she does say that the potion's not supposed to be used for animal transformations, which is kind of like half human, half cat. And that that'd be a really questionable thing, but you know. I definitely want to talk a bit about Madame Pomfrey, the true unsung hero of Hogwarts. The MVP of this book, at least. Yeah. Most valuable. Give her all the medals. Promote her. Give her the Order of Merlin, a first class. Give her Dumbledore's job. Give her Snape's hair. You know, give her everything she deserves. Um, I think it's so great that she's earned a reputation for not asking questions. And I feel like in some extent, people would be like, why? She should follow through. Why are kids doing this? But I feel like she's learned somewhere along the way that like you need to be a safe place the students can go to to get physically healed and if at any point you follow up and ask them how it happened it's gonna you're gonna lose that trust from the students and you're gonna have a bunch of like third years trying to cure themselves of things they've done to themselves and just making it worse like I think it's dangerous to create an environment where the students feel like there's judgment. I do feel it's quite smart to do it that way. And I understand to some extent, like, you don't want the kids to be doing dangerous things, but there's a hundred teachers at the school whose job it is is to supervise the students and to, like, enforce the rules. And Madame Pomfrey's job is just to keep them physically in one piece. And I think she's done a great job of, like, the fact that Hermione and the boys first thought is like Madame Pomfrey won't question it she'll just make you better and I think that's really well done on her part I think the only time she ever questions things it's when it's the administration or Dumbledore's fault like when something happens to Harry and she's always like tuttering like this is all Dumbledore's fault so she it's only when it's like things that are injuring the, the kids for no apparent reason but if it's just kids doing kid stuff, it's whatever. Yeah, I think she like expects kids to do dumb stuff and she knows it's her job to fix them. She gets annoyed when grown adults who are supposed to be responsible do dumb stuff and it hurts the kids. Because like if your job is just heal the children, it's got to be annoying to have people who are supposed to be responsible and helping you do your job being counterproductive to that goal. Like it's pretty douchey on the part of everyone else at Hogwarts. But I do think that like because she's earned that reputation, kids are going to go to her rather than trying to fix themselves. And it's going to in the long run have a really good impact on like that her reputation and how kids see her and just like the culture of healing at Hogwarts. And I love that. I love that for her. I also think this poor woman cleans up so many messes that can often have been entirely prevented by just any proper adult supervision whatsoever. The amount of times that teachers actively encourage stupid things kids do that get them hurt. And Madame Pomfrey is always the one cleaning it up. I don't know how she puts up with it. I don't know how she hasn't murdered Dumbledore. Like that would have been a plot twist. Book six, Madame Pomfrey murders Dumbledore. Why? Because he's an idiot and she's done with it. And I wouldn't hold it against her. I I think she's she's such a good character that I never thought of really when I read it when I was younger and now I'm like how wonderful to like it's weird but like in the state of healthcare nowadays where there are you know teenage girls and young women who like don't want to tell their doctor when their period starts because then the doctor might notice their period irregularities and like try and find out if they've had abortions and like mess with their personal health care situations and taking away their choices about their body. It's so great to know there's someone out there in this lovely physical magical world who's just like, I'm just going to heal you. That's my job. Nothing else is my job. Fix it to the best of my ability and that's it. Done. Case closed. None of my business. And I respect it. Yeah, sort of swinging back to Dumbledore's office or climbing back up the stairs to Dumbledore's office, as it were. Uh, I think, I mean, obviously Phoenixes and Fox specifically become such a huge part of the story later on. But I think it's lovely how similar Harry is to the Phoenix in a way that like, is so multifaceted. First of all, we have Harry who, like the Phoenix, has almost died and then later does die and then always comes back. And he, each time he dies, he sort of rises from the ashes as someone a little different, right? Like the first time Voldemort almost killed him, Harry rose from the ashes as the chosen one. He wasn't just Harry Potter anymore because he'd been marked. He's now the chosen one. And when Harry doesn't die when Voldemort tries to kill him in book seven, he rises again and now he's, he's the master of death. He's actually the hero at that moment he is the hero that everyone was hoping he would be so again he sort of died and been reborn but better and I think that's really cool that combination and sort of that similarity they have especially given that Harry has a phoenix wand um 
I also kind of think it's interesting because they talk about Phoenix as being able to carry a really heavy load. And I feel like Harry carries a very heavy emotional load throughout the entire entirety and like that's his responsibility he has a huge weight of responsibility on his shoulders like hey dude you're the chosen one you're the only one who can fight him good luck figure it out you're 12 um and he he carries he carries that weight you know and it's just another example of of that similarity and also even in loyalty like they talk about how loyal a pet a phoenix is and like harry has such unflinching loyalty to dumbledore you know he's his man through and through as he says and but also to his friends that I think it's it's cool how similar they are and again it makes the choice of Phoenix Feather Wand for Harry even more special and like on point yeah I do think uh I do think back in the day there was a lot of theories about Harry becoming an Animagus and I think it was theorized that he would become a Phoenix because there's such big Phoenix symbolism for Harry in the book and also there's a lot of emphasis on like Animagi in like, the third book and stuff. I feel like Hermione is the only one in the trio who would have had the patience to actually go through the process of like holding the leaf under your tongue for six months or whatever and like waiting for the full moon like it's such a tedious long process I don't think Harry or Ron have ever or will ever have the patience for it I could see maybe Hermione deciding well, to if do they, it. If, if it was necessary like near the end of the series I could see them doing it out of necessity. I don't think even like book seven, Harry, we need to figure this out to fight Voldemort could handle that level of like constant little things you have to pay attention to in order to like achieve it. Like I, I just, I, I also don't, like I feel like that's a more advanced magic than Harry can do. Like he's really good at a couple things, but that's like a really complicated level of transfiguration that I, I don't think, I don't even know if he could do, to be honest. Like he's really powerful, blah, 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 love and all that jazz. But like love doesn't turn you into a bird. I do think it was an old theory, like, like, post, like, uh, Prisoner of Azkaban, but, like, before maybe, like, Word of Phoenix or Prisoner of Azkaban. But it's definitely interesting. There's a lot of, like, relation to Harry and, like, a phoenix. Yeah. It's, it's, it's very cool. I feel like if Harry hadn't have, like, I mean, time travel is weird, but if his Patronus hadn't already been decided to be the, the stag... By because he had already seen a stag Patronus because of time travel, I think there's a chance his Patronus would have been a phoenix because I think it's a creature that like really correlates to who he is as a person. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Pottery Visited. We'll be back next time to discuss chapter 13 of Chamber of Secrets, The Very Secret Diary. As always, you can always reach out to us on social media at Pottery Visited or you can email us at podcast at gmail.com and we'll see you next time. Goodbye. Thank you.